On May 6, 1994, Deborah Batts became the first openly gay Article III federal judge in the country. Her sexual orientation was mentioned not once during her confirmation hearing. The oath of office will be administered by Circuit Judge Lawrence W. Pierce. Ms. Batts was a law clerk for Judge Pierce when he was a district judge. Do you, Deborah A. Batts, solemnly swear that you will administer justice without respect to persons? That same year, while Judge Batts was making history, Paul Etkin was clerking for U.S. Supreme Court Justice Harry Blackman. Allison Nathan was an undergraduate at Cornell University and Pamela Chen was a senior trial attorney for the Special Litigation Section of the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice. I do. Mr. Marshall, will you invest Judge Bass with the role, assisted by her daughter, and escort her to the bench? Exactly 25 years after Judge Batts' landmark achievement, these four judges met in the library of the Thurgood Marshall Courthouse in Manhattan to compare their experiences as lesbian and gay members of the federal bench. This is their conversation. If we went back 25 years, uh, in 1994, I was uh, nominated again because uh, by Bill Clinton, because originally I had been, uh, I hadn't been nominated, but uh, Senator Moynihan put my name forward uh, while uh, George uh, Bush one was, uh, president. Um, it didn't uh, go very far, although I did go down to the Department of Justice a lot mm -hmm. uh, and uh, had a great time. Um, but I think that uh, every time I came back, there was nothing. And so Senator Moynihan asked what the problem was. And they were very, very uh, discreet mm -hmm. because they said, while Professor Batts is a very fine, intelligent, interesting person. We think that her view of what a federal judge should be is not necessarily what our view of a federal judge should be. So that was it. But then again, let's face it, in 1994, I had tenure at uh, Fordham. So I had a lifetime job no matter what I decided to do or what happened. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, that was interesting. Uh, it made it, um, so when S Bill Clinton came in, I, I should st back up. Um, Judge Reinhardt on the Ninth Circuit uh, wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post uh, on Halloween actually, which is one of my favorite, one of my <laughs> very favorite um, uh, holidays. And you are wearing a bat sweater. Yes, I am. <laughs> yes, I am. And uh, he essentially uh, said, I think that, uh, let me see if I get this right, the title of the, uh, was The Court and the Closet, Why Should Federal Judges Have to Hide Homosexuality? That was right out there. Uh, what and, year was that? Uh, 1993. 93. This was October 31st, 1993. Mm. Uh, and it was a very powerful um, and uh, sort of shaking the, 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 the rafters, uh, not in an a, a aggressive way, but he said, why not? And I thought, gee, that's great. So I think that um, it may have been a few months later um, that uh, President Clinton 
nominated me. And I still think that the biggest impetus Mm -hmm. uh, was uh, Judge Reinhardt's uh, article right out there, mm -hmm. right out there. Did you, were you skeptical when they first said that your views as a professor were not necessarily the ones that would be uh, consistent with what they wanted for a judge? Or did you have any reason to doubt that that was the real reason? Uh, no, no, I didn't because um, I had wonderful interviews with the people from the Department of Justice that I talked with, but I was very honest with them. And, and, and quite frank. And so I think that they feared that I might be uh, one of those activist judges. Uh -huh. uh, and so I think that's really what happened. Did it be, was your sexual orientation an issue raised by anyone in the Conference. process in terms of the confirmation hearing or anything with the, with the senators? It, no, in terms of the, the senators, um, well, <laughs> my confirmation hearing, um, the Committee on the Judiciary, and I'm going to just list the people, uh, Ed Kennedy, Howard Metzenbaum, mm -hmm. uh, Dennis DeConcini, uh, Patrick Leahy, Howell Heflin, Paul Simon of Illinois, uh, Herbert Cole, Diane Feinstein, Carol Mosley Braun, Orrin Hatch, Strom Thurmond, Alan K. Simpson, Charles Grassley, mm -hmm. Arlen Specter, Hank Brown, William Cohen, and Larry Pressler. A uh, formidable and distinguished group. Uh, and I think that uh, I was concerned that uh, this would be an issue uh, for them. So I was thoroughly vetted, I mean, thoroughly vetted by Clinton's uh, Department of, of Justice. Um, I, I remember at one point when they were giving me examples or, of questions uh, and I gave an answer and one of the poor uh, <laughs> uh, a, a said, I can't believe you said that. <laughs> and, and I looked at him as if, well, what, what's wrong? So they had a lot of work to do with me. <laughs> Uh, and, and I am very grateful to them because I think that uh, uh, my actually becoming a judge is in great part due to uh, their working with me and on me. Yeah. But I have to say, I think it's you, though, that literally broke down the closet door <laughs> and allowed the rest yeah. of us to walk through it. That's right. Yep. Well, I would like to take cre uh, credit for that, but um, I don't think that I can um, because my sexual orientation, I thought, was going to be a big issue in the confirmation hearings. And I just gave you the list of the people who were on the Judiciary Committee. But what happened, in fact, is that only one senator showed up for my hearing. One, <laughs> one? senator, one. And do you know who that was? One of the sweetest uh, senators going, Howard Metzenbaum. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. He is the one who showed up. So he, he asked me uh, questions that had nothing to do with uh, uh, anything about my uh, personal life. Uh, he you know, asked me what it was like to be a prosecutor, what it's like to be a professor. Um, and then he asked me questions about what my reaction would be as a judge to certain things which was, was very pleasant, and it was over in a nanosecond. Yeah, that's so... So all but, of that for nothing. <laughs> no, but I think you should take more credit, because I think you were so unimpeachable as a, as a candidate that, that, that there was no percentage in trying to attack you personally. And, I, and, and this is, would be my guess. And that, brave. Um, yes. Brave in 1994. Exactly. To, to, to be the first, to be willing to put yourself out there, even if it didn't pan out. I don't know... Um, you talked about the DOJ person vetting process, but I'm curious about the FBI vetting process because uh, even in 2011, when yeah. I had my FBI background check, that it was fine and I was open and um, I had a long-term partner. But when they went to interview her, when they went to interview my now wife, Meg, um, <laughs> they, the FBI agent said to her, so should I use the spouse form or the roommate form? He, 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 he didn't know and she said, well, I don't know, how do, how, do you, how do you normally handle these things? And he clearly 
hadn't Doesn't had come up any up experience yeah. <laughs> with it. And so she said, I, I think you should maybe use the, the spouse form, even though technically um, because of the, the law at right. the time, the Defense of Marriage Act, we couldn't legally marry, be married, deemed married under federal law. And it was also, there was not marriage in New York yet. Um, but so, I mean, that ended up being more funny than anything, but I'm curious what, what your vetting process was. <laughs> um, I had lovely um, agents. Oh, one FBI agent was a man, one was a woman. They were young, they were, they were fun. Um, my neighbors, uh, because of course they came and talked with my neighbors, um, were so impressed with them. Uh, so I've gone through all of this and it was my final meeting with them and then there was a sort of uh, pause and um, uh, the uh, uh, man agent said, now, is there anything about you that we should know that we don't? Pause, pause, pause. <laughs> and I said, I don't think it's any of your damn business, but I'm gay. <laughs> And then the reaction was amazing. It was like, like a relief. And I said, why? And they said, because if you, oh, he, was it anybody who knows that you're gay? Yeah. And then I listed my family and everything. He said, because if you were not out, mm -hmm. uh, it might be a source of blackmail. Right. Uh, and that's what they were concerned with. So I was, um, but I mean, that was just amazing to me. The, it came at the very, very end. Yeah. That's interesting. I think the bravery point that you made about Debbie going through the process is really important. And I think that partly explains why a lot of people don't, didn't want to go through the process right. or weren't willing to go through the process in the right. 90s. I mean, the 90s were, were times when senators you know, could oppose a sub cabinet nominee for being a damn lesbian, you know, mm -hmm. and and there it was the days of Bowers versus Hardwick, when and the days of Defensive Marriage Act, and people weren't sure what kind of scrutiny there was going to be. People didn't know that the FBI agents would be as accepting uh, as as yours were and ours ended up being. And I think a lot of people, one of the reasons there weren't any. Uh, openly gay yeah. Article Three Article Three nominees from '94 until 2011 was people weren't sure what it was going to look like. Were they going to scrutinize our social media? You know, in the 2000s, right. were they going to um, delve into your personal delve life into your it, personal yeah. life and and talk to you know people you've dated? Were they going to apply a level of scrutiny that's different from what they would apply to straight nominees? Um, and then in when I went through the process in 2011. The whole thing from the first call to the confirmation vote was about a year. And that whole time, I wasn't quite sure. Yeah. It never came up openly at my yeah. hearing or anything, but I never, I, I was never quite sure what people were thinking about how my sexual orientation fit into this whole process. But I was always a little nervous about right. what they might be looking into. I, like Debbie, didn't have any problems with the FBI agents. They were. They were perfectly appropriate, and they understood everything. They interviewed my partner, um, uh, and they were totally Which professional. Which form did they use? I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember the form they used. I don't remember. Pam, it's interesting that you said that you had two aspects, Asian and, and lesbian. Um, it's very funny to me, because in 1994, I actually sold myself as a threefer. Uh, I call myself the trifecta. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes, yes uh, because there weren't that many women, uh, and so I said that uh, I was the most efficient appointment that was made uh, because they got... Uh, check, check, check. Yeah, exactly. Schumer and I had a good laugh about that. He said we could check three boxes. Right. I don't think that should be on the <laughs> <laughs> Although I don't know if you could claw back my appointment at this but point. To the, you know, to the role model point, so it's 1994. I was in college God, in yeah. 1994 and was an openly gay college student and um, uh, involved in um, advocacy issues then. And I don't think, I was not aware of your nomination. It, uh, I'm not sure of the exact timing, but I certainly wouldn't have thought, uh, you know, in 1990, 1992, 93, 94, when I was 
coming out and developing a sense of um, wanting to be a vocal and positive member of the LGBT community, that being a judge was a thing that could be in my future. That was just not on the radar. Um, and, um, and then at some point in law school, I knew that there was an, L there was an openly gay mm. federal judge and it uh, had an impact on the horizons that I saw open to me. That's wonderful. Yeah, I actually remember in 1994, it sort of was on my radar screen because I was clerking in, right. in mm. 1993, 94 for Justice Blackman at the Supreme Court. And so I think everyone who clerks thinks about being a judge because it's you're there working directly with the judge. And I, I, I was starting to think about how amazing a job being a judge would be. And I remember when Debbie Batts went through the confirmation, the nomination and, and confirmation process, I remember following it very closely, and I remember actually that year running into uh, Susan Davies, uh -huh. who uh, was working, I guess, in the administration for. for she was in the White House Council. Yeah. She was in the White House Counsel's office doing doing nominations, yeah. and I ran into her about a month or two after um, Debbie was confirmed, and I remember talking to her about it, and it was a big deal. Uh, it, it, it was because I, I was out clerking. I I. I I think I was the only openly gay person clerking that year in 93, 94. And um, I didn't quite know what it meant. You know, I had been out only a few years, really. I, I, I was kind of out in college to a few friends, but then when I went to law school, I was out. And I sort of decided when I was in law school, I'm gonna be out on my resume. That was kind of the big decision to make. And the, my rationale was uh, for summer associate jobs, for clerkships, for, for associate jobs, I don't wanna go to a place, to an employer that would have a problem with my being gay. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just put on there the LGBT Law Students Association, which in 1991 was a group of about 10 people at <laughs> Yale Law School. Um, so I decided to be out. But but I remember when, when Debbie was appointed, from that point on, I realized being a judge is not incompatible with being a, a gay person. You gave birth to these two. <laughs> <laughs> so we have you to blame. Right? <laughs> or me to thank. Yes. yes. <laughs> but it's so funny. My story is so different than all of yours in the sense that I came very late to the game. So in 1994, I was at Maine Justice in the Civil Rights Division and living a completely straight life. Uh, although realizing that that wasn't where I should be was around the corner. But interestingly, when I graduated Georgetown in 86, around the time that I was there, Georgetown was having a, uh, a lawsuit filed, or the lawsuit was filed against them by the gay groups who, because they wouldn't recognize them and give them the same privileges as all the other groups. I was in law school, oops, sorry, and I was completely oblivious to that because it wasn't even on my radar. I w and I had a boyfriend in law school, which is part of how I started my speech when I went back to school, that I'm giving this lavender speech and it would have shocked me and my boyfriend back in 1985. <laughs> so for me, you, your sort of phenomenal, groundbreaking ascension to the bench wasn't anywhere in my consciousness, which is interesting uh, to me that I ended up here and now. And it almost makes you feel a little guilty, or at least it makes me feel guilty because, well, you feel like you didn't sort of participate in any of the fights, the mm -hmm. stone walls, the any you sort of, you know, breaking down of barriers, and yet you're the beneficiary of what everyone else did before, namely you and many others. So thank you, but I feel terribly guilty. <laughs> you, you should not, you should not. Um, it's interesting because there is a, a, a significant uh, age and time uh, gap uh, from me to the rest of you. Uh, and I still think, though, that it was not easy for you all as you went through the process, even though there was this lone wolf sitting up here in the Southern District of <laughs> New York. Um, and I can't tell you. <laughs> I can't tell you how happy I was when I got company. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody to have noodles with in China, yeah. Chinatown. There you go. Hey, Absolutely. Debbie, can I ask you, you have a much longer view of our particular history in terms of lawyers and becoming judges and all. Um, do you think it's a very different climate now for young lawyers that they can be open, just like Ali was saying, like that it's not going to hurt their career. And in fact, as we all have experienced, it might actually help your career if you're openly gay. Have you seen that evolution? Well, the only thing that I can say in answer to that, Pam, is that I have 
learned that uh, there are more uh, gay lawyers out there than I thought. Mm -hmm. And uh, often people will come up and tell me that they're gay. Uh, and I think it's wonderful, or I will see them in a context that lets me know that they are gay. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, not necessarily marching in the gay pride parade, but uh, still do being very active in one of the uh, gay legal organizations or mm -hmm. something. I think that it's 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 really important that people uh, pass it on. Uh, that you know, you get to a certain point. There are many reasons why you did get there. You don't know all of them, mm -hmm. uh, but you can certainly uh, be a, a, a mentor or someone who encourages people who uh, really think uh, that they can't do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, um, they can do it. Mm -hmm. They can do whatever they set their minds to do. Uh, assuming that they are not uh, uh, beaten down or uh, uh, harassed or bothered by people in a position of power who can make decisions about them. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I think that uh, I know more and more uh, gay lawyers. Um, I now know more and more uh, gay judges at a state and a federal level. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's really wonderful. I, in a way, I think that the state court judges who are elected actually really have to put it on a line uh, because they need people to know whom they are electing. And mm -hmm. I think that that's really very brave, actually, mm -hmm. and uh, very necessary uh, for them to survive. And so I, the state court um, uh, gay association uh, is is thriving, and they are helping each other. Um, I know people who were law secretaries who then became judges themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a, a, a very a good system there, mm -hmm. but it's not dependent upon um, you know uh, senators who don't know you, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but have their own views about what life should be, what's right, what's wrong. So I, I think that um, it's very important uh, for everybody to do what they think they can. Never shy away because you think they're not going to let you do it. Give them the opportunity to let you do it mm -hmm. by being there and showing that that's what you want to do. And I think that that will be helpful. Fantastic. Yeah. That's a great end point. It is. Yeah, that's it. <clears throat> you guys are probably should do this more often, but with yeah, drinks. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> can we come back next week? Yes, exactly. <laughs> with martinis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.